Pardon me, ma'am. Do you know what a checker is? A checker? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Isn't that the person at the airport that checks you through, you know, when you go through security? Are they called a checker? <laughs> uh, pardon me, sir. Do you happen uh, to know what a, what a checker is? Uh, I think it's an auto parts chain somewhere around the country. Car parts store. Hey! Do either of you know what a checker is? I don't know, what do you think? Maybe one of those game pieces or... Maybe some guy who checks people coming into a bar and throws crazy guys out? The answer begins in 1913, when an ambitious Russian immigrant named Morris Markin came to the United States with virtually no money. You've done a lot of research on Morris Markin, the founder of Checker. I did, indeed I did. And uh, what's your basic conclusion based upon your study of his life? Morris Markin came to this country in 1913, which incidentally was the year that they put up the Woolworth building. Incidentally, it was the year that they opened up the Grand Central Terminal that we know of nowadays. And he was out to achieve the American dream. A tailor by trade, he settled in Chicago but unintentionally fell into the cab making business when he was forced to take over a taxicab body manufacturing facility in Chicago in order to protect a loan. Markin moved the taxi body operation to a vacant auto plant in nearby Kalamazoo, Michigan. The first checker cabs to come out of the factory appeared in 1922 and were called checkers because the plant had been producing bodies for the Chicago Checker Cab Company. The name stuck. However, Morris Markin was the very first taxi cab operator to engage blacks as drivers. And prior to Morris Markin, the only job that a black could have in a cab garage was washing the cars. But Morris Markin, aside from hiring blacks to drive cabs, and mind you, in those days, 1924, 25 in Chicago, who ever heard of a black working for an old lily white company. It was unheard of. What else did he accomplish? Morris Walker was the first fleet operator who gave to his drivers hospitalization, which was unheard of. He gave them vacation with pay, which was unheard of. As time passed, the checker cab evolved with the times bringing out new models every couple of years to keep pace with its competitors. Perhaps the most remarkable 20th century American taxi ever built was the 1940 model with a retracting rear steel roof. Not only was the landaulet top innovative, but it even offered an optional canopy when the roof was down. And he had one garage, this garage I'm, sp I'm speaking about, was situated at 61st Street and York Avenue. And in the garage, he had toilet facilities where a driver could take a shower. Many drivers back in the 20s and 30s come out from, a, come out from an apartment building, they didn't have any toilets. They didn't have, they would have to go into the hallway and take a shower. That made Markin remarkable. And he had a sign in the same garage that stated, go to work with a smile on your face because the passenger likes to see a happy driver. That's what made Markin so remarkable. No one since or beyond or whatever you want to call it has ever fielded more cabs than Morris Markin. The high, uh, the high time of his career in New York, he owned and operated 3,750 cabs. In Chicago, a city which in 1932 
had 5,000 cabs operating on the streets, had 4,000 of them owned by Morris Market. He owned 80% of the cabs in Chicago. He owned every cab in Pittsburgh. Let's say it were 500. If the number be 500, Market owned that amount of cabs. He owned three quarters of the cabs in Minneapolis and three quarters of the cabs located in Cleveland. So between New York, Chicago, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, and Minneapolis, he owned about 10,000 cabs. <laughs> Nobody before or since or later or what have you owned them that amount of cabs. He used to insure his own cars, didn't he? He did insure his cars. But one thing about market, he wanted you to go on and drive safely, regardless of our productivity. It meant nothing to market, because one accident wipes out all of the productivity a cab could get. World War II saw checker manufacturing cease taxi care production in 1941, and a switch to a wartime product line consisting of military trailers, Ford truck body parts, even went so far as to construct three Jeep prototypes for U.S. military evaluation. They were not only four-wheel drive, but four-wheel steer as well. The government chose Willys Overland instead, but at least one of these interesting Jeeps survives today. With the cessation of hostilities, Checker resumed taxi production with an all-new, up-to-date design that continued Checker's tradition of seating for five in the rear using jump seats. Like all Checkers, they were put into immediate service not only in the U.S., but all over the world. While the post-war model was modern in 1947, by 1952 it had become dated. Checker was aware of this and began to design an all-new model that would bring them back into the game. The preparation for the totally new Checker taxi, known as the A8 model, was so extensive that the factory was shut down and no 1955 Checker cabs were produced in order to adapt the assembly line. With the new A8 model, taxi riders were introduced for the first time to the body shape and round jump seats that would become familiar to three generations of Americans. By 1958, Checker attempted to modernize their A8 design by adding four headlights and a chrome mesh grille. They would keep this basic theme until the end of production in 1982. 1960 found Checker pushing a small dealer network to promote and sell its new civilian-oriented model known as the Superba. After 1961, the name was changed to the Marathon. Whether you wanted a taxi or a private sedan, Checker had a brochure for you. There was only a trim difference between the taxi and civilian models. As usual, a steady flow of Checkers were put into service all around the globe. This particular 1960 era Checker was serving Stockholm, Sweden. The Swedish dealers offered a school bus package that put two rectangular folding jump seats facing the rear seat so that seating for 10 to 12 small students was claimed to be possible. A plexiglass partition was fitted, presumably to keep boisterous passengers safely contained behind the driver. A limited production station wagon model was also produced from 1960 to 1974, and Checker even offered a power rear seat as an option on early models. European variations of the station wagon included various ambulances and even hearses. For 1961, the product line was expanded again with the introduction of the eight and six door Aerobus wagons for airport, hotel, and general transportation needs. Unlike its competitors, which cut, spliced, and stretched production vehicles, the six and eight door checkers were built from scratch to be extra long. There was even an eight-door wagon for prisoner transport. Checker called it the Marshal. To cater to those wanting nine-passenger capacity in a four-door sedan, 
Checker introduced a jumbo sedan in 1963 that was nine inches longer in the rear seating area than a regular Checker, which allowed for large folding rectangular jump seats and nine passenger capacity. While long wheelbase Checker cabs were produced in very limited quantities, they were occasionally spotted in numerous cities and countries. Some jumbos skipped serious commercial service and became formal limousines. In 1969, Checker built slightly over a hundred of these jumbo wheelchair cars a good 10 years before it was fashionable to transport the handicapped in specialized vehicles. For those interested in buying a new Checker, there were several options available that included buying from the Checker factory directly through their sales building just behind the main plant. A secondary option was purchasing a car from one of 25 dealers in the States and nine overseas. Many of the dealers were small and most were selling checkers in addition to other vehicles. Some of the largest checker dealers were in New York City and Fort Lauderdale, Florida. The dealership in Florida made a habit of customizing brand new taxis and selling them to wealthy patrons in the Miami area. Their service department also worked on broken checkers imported from the Bahamas. A third purchase option for customers was ordering a checker by mail. Once a request for information was received, a packet was sent to the potential buyer with a brochure for either the taxi cab or civilian marathon. Included was a list of options and a color chart. Checkers were available in no less than 96 different colors. In addition to the huge number of colors to choose from, Checker offered over 200 two-tone possible color combinations. In the city of Chicago alone, there were over six possible red and white combinations available on a Checker. Once the customer had chosen the desired options in color, Checker would send them an invoice and a requirement for a $500 deposit. When the car was built, the buyer frequently would go to the factory in Kalamazoo, Michigan to pick up the new vehicle. By early 1982, Checker Motors was still producing about 20 cars per day. Many of the Checker executives drove their own products and the fleet was proudly lined up outside of the main offices. And hello, I am Jim Garrison. I worked at Checker Motors for 32 years, from 1977 until the very last day when they closed on June 25th, 2009. I was privileged, I guess, to watch the last parts come off of an assembly line at Checker Motors. Overall, the history of the place, I think, is as remarkable as any company, especially car company, my interest, as uh, that as the history of any others. Uh, pick a Packard or a Cadillac or an REO. And uh, the story of Checker that uh, began as, a, as a, uh, an immigrant's uh, dream to uh, advance in the American uh, free enterprise system which he did remarkably well. And uh, working at Checker was uh, a pretty interesting experience. They built cars and as a person who likes cars and works on cars, I chose to go to an auto factory. We also had a Fisher body plant in Kalamazoo, but they were not uh, as interested in hiring me as Checker was, so I went with Checker. And uh, I'm glad I did. It was a, a stable place to work. It was a, I think, fair and reasonable place to work. And uh, it uh, struggled along through all sorts of re recessions and uh, challenging economic times and some boom times. So uh, they did well. Behind the main offices, Checker kept a service department to handle not only the customers' cars, but their own as well. Many brand new 1982 Checkers were awaiting a final prep behind the factory near the end of production. Due to a lack of parts to finish the final cars, Checker parked at least 100 brand new cars in their test track for several months until they could be sent through the factory again and finished off. The final assembly line Checker, built on July 12, 1982, was number 2,000 out of a total production of only 2,000 checkers built that year. 
It currently resides in the Gilmore Car Museum in Hickory Corners, Michigan. Checker, of course, stopped production of taxi cabs and all cars in 1982. The reason primarily, I think, was that it was less expensive for taxi franchises and individual operators to buy a regular run-of-the-mill, so to speak, car instead of a purpose-built taxi. The Plymouths and uh, Fords and Chevrolet vehicles that they could get that were mass-produced were less expensive and still suited the need to get somebody from point A to point B. And but there were other challenges that helped lead the checker car to its demise. The government had new and stringent economy standards, fuel economy standards, and they had uh, pollution standards. Uh, they also had uh, crash tests. All of the research and development to meet with those new regulations during the late 70s and early 80s made it more difficult for Checker to, uh, to do those things. As most folks already know, Checker didn't have enough money to uh, design new tooling to make a new car. And so they were just getting by on what they had and when what they had became obsolete, it was time to just uh, let that dodo go. And. Uh, what they did after that and what they had actually done before. In, in 1976, Checker had started doing contract work for primarily General Motors and they developed that uh, after the taxi line had gone down. They were a supplier of hoods and roofs and doors and tailgates and trunk lids and frame parts and all sorts of other things that go into into vehicles. They were actually a world-class supplier. With the end of production, Checker taxis began to come off the road for a variety of reasons. Many cities like Chicago had age restrictions so cabs came offline after five years of service no matter what their condition. Few wanted to put the Checkers back into service again because the car had become an orphan and parts were getting hard to get so cabbies generally shunned them. Many were scrapped in the late 1980s due to a lack of interest. By 1990, most had been retired from the major fleets, but a few small operators kept them going for a few years more. My family, uh started the business in 19, bought the business in 1956 and uh, we got our first checker in, in 1961 and uh, we continued buying checkers until we closed up uh, and we wouldn't quit making the checkers. Our last new model was a 79 model. Uh, the checkers worked better for us because we could take parts off and uh, reuse them, cannibalize them and uh, and they did a lot better job than the Fords and the Chevys that we used previously. So, we were firm believers in Checker and hated to see him go out. And uh, what year was your final final year of operation? Our final year, uh, 1996. Mm -hmm. And you own a Checker today? I have uh, two Checkers. Two Checkers? I have a 78 and a 79. All right. Do uh, people miss them in Paris, Kentucky? Oh, yeah. They, uh, every once in a while, somebody said, do you still have one of those cabs? <laughs> Did you pick them up at the factory or did you buy them all used? Uh, we uh, bought some used and some new and we did drive to Kalamazoo and pick them up. Did you ever try some other kinds of car? Uh, after we went to Checker, we never did try anything else till we couldn't get any more Checkers and then we went back to the Chevrolet's. By the 21st century, most Checkers had disappeared completely and only a handful are still in service as of 2013. The factory itself closed June 24, 2009, and was torn down shortly thereafter. Oh.
Hello, my name is Peter. This is Brooklyn, New York. This is a check a taxi cab. There was a lot of them around here back in the day. It's 2011 right now, and there's really none left except the ones like this that are used for the movies, and television, promotion, parades, occasional beatdown. <laughs> and uh, this is mine. This is a 73. Did the work all over. I did the paint over. I did the chrome. Bumpers got done, glass is new, two-stage roof light, a lot of fun, plenty of room in the trunk for about four people, four adults, maybe about six kids in the trunk, depends on what's going on in your family, and uh, and there it is, this is, uh, this is my pride and joy, I love it, and um, I'm probably the only person who can lean on it, because I swear to God, if I see anybody else lean on my car, I'm going to throw them a beat and I'm going to get real mad. <laughs> That's it. Take care. Enjoy. Hi Ben, how are you doing? My name is Alvaro Antonio Gallego, in Spanish, and English is Al Gallego. <laughs> okay. I, uh, I am uh, the founder of all the taxi instruments and taxi depot. I have been in business for 40 years. In New York City? In New York City. I came to America in 1964 and I moved to New York City. 1971, and ever since I got here, I, besides driving a cab, oh, I, uh, I learned how to uh, repair taxi meters, so I got my license, and, and that's the end of the story. I've been in the taxi business since 1971, and uh, I own a checker cab, and a London cab, and I am in love with this industry. I think it's been very good to me. And I have been able to meet a lot of people along the way. They like to be uh, surrounded by yellow all the time. <laughs> so why do you still have a checker today? I don't know. I just can't get rid of it. I mean, uh, this is this is how... <laughs> A few. I don't have a place to put it. I still <laughs> want it. I'm crazy about it, you know. And then uh, on Sundays I drive my uh, checker around the city sometimes. I take my family out for a spin and uh, that's it. Even though they don't like it too much, you know, because it calls attention. And they don't want to be on the spotlight. They say, oh, people want to be undercover. They don't want to ride in one of these. <laughs> so you rent this one out for movies, too? Uh, sometimes, yeah. They, uh, they, uh, they, uh, we rent it for movies, films, uh, commercials, and all kinds of uh, projects. And then uh, it's pretty excited. I mean, I think uh, something that... I guess it's on my plan already. <laughs> uh, I've been around the uh, all the uh, taxis in New York City, and, and uh, it's been my life. And I guess I guess I, I don't want to let it die. I think uh, I see the checker is a very spacious car. It's built to last. And, has a lot of room, and uh, and he has done a beautiful job for the past 50 years. I mean, uh, no other car like check a cab, and I hope uh, one day they produce the manufacture a vehicle exactly like this. I mean, he has everything it takes to be in the streets of New York City, and uh, it brings a lot of memories and nostalgic people. With, uh, that went around 
the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. First time I owned a Cheka was um, 14 years ago, I believe. I had a, a, it was a 82. It was a Chicago cab. It had no power, like, in comparison to this cab. What what made you buy a checker in the first place? Why? Because I, I drove a checker in 1960, and I found it to be, number one, the definitive taxi cab. And being that I have cab drivers, stuff in my blood. You've been driving a cab for how long? I've been driving, a, I started driving a cab in 1960, up until 1997, when I was forced to retire because, unfortunately, I was the last English-speaking cab driver in New York. Well, why do you still drive a checker when everybody else has stepped into other kinds of vehicles? Because it's a very good car. You have great visibility. Do you get bigger tips? I'm not driving a cab anymore. This, I, uh, it's a misconception that I use the cab uh, to pick up people. I do pick up people, but if they want to go on a tour or if somebody is getting married, there's nothing better than a checker because other cars, it could be even a, a Bentley. There's only one checker. 1971, I had gotten out of the Army a year earlier, and I needed a job. A friend of mine was driving a cab, and he said they need a guy. So I went and I got a license, a class one or whatever it was, and the next thing I know, I'm driving a, a yellow checker cab in Queens, New York. I don't know if you know this, but these taxis have jump seats in them, so you can get more fares. And it reminded me when I was a kid, and I'd be in, in a taxi with my family, I was the little one, believe it or not. So I would be the one they put in the jump seat. So there I was, driving one of these cabs in New York, and I thought I was on the top, I thought it was the top of the world. So I did it for about seven months. And the reason I quit was because one of my co-workers was robbed in the cab. And he was harmed. And I felt like I got out of the army in one piece. And I didn't want to become a victim. So sadly, I said goodbye to my yellow cab one day, and this is the first time I've been in a yellow cab since. And let me tell you, a lot of technology has passed since the uh, checker cab. But it's fun driving it again. So here is the jump seat that I used to scramble to get upon as a child. And now here it is live, and it's just not as comfortable. Not as comfortable as it was, but I was about, you know, three and a half feet tall, and I weighed about 45 pounds. So how, how long has that seat been there, Alex? For 37 and a half years. Wow. There it is. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure uh, visiting the old days. Listen, this cab is eventually becoming uh, an heirloom, a relic, a symbol of days gone by when people got into taxi cabs and it was a very comfortable ride and they had cab drivers that could speak, read, write English, and if you ask the cab driver what was last night's baseball scores, he would look at you and spit them out, whereas today, these new people are driving a cab. Know nothing about what, what it was all about.